Welcome back to another episode of Clinton's Forgotten Murders. We are your hosts, Celeste. And Brian. And today we have a case that is uh, particularly, I think, uh, gruesome. It's a sad case, but it's also a really interesting like, look into a slice of life and the way that certain systems that we take for granted today work uh, and how they worked very differently back then. So I hope you'll stay tuned and buckle up because it's going to be a wild ride. The case begins in 1894, with the actual murder taking place in 1895. So we're going to set a little bit of the scene for you uh, before we before we get to this, you know, the lead up to this terrible event that happened. Uh, 1894, and the place is North Clinton near the Big Tree, which was considered to be like the dividing line between Clinton and Lyons. And we are right across the street from what used to be the Clinton Brewing Company. Now, at that time, it was this giant, massive brick building, and today it is Jewel, Osco. And the houses that these all took place in are the parking lots. But back in the day, it used to be a nice little working-class neighborhood. 13th Avenue North used to be Arnold Street, so we're right on the corner of Arnold Street and North 2nd Street. In this house is a family known as the Swansons. They are a Swedish family and consists of five members, August Swanson being the head of the household. He is 32. He's married to Mary, who is 30 years old, and they have three sons together. August Jr., who is nine, little Albert, who is seven, and then Victor, who is four years old. House they live in is about a story and a half. It's a pretty modest house, uh, frame style. It's only about a block and a half from the river. So they're not def- they're, they're definitely not a wealthy family. You know, they're they're pretty working class. Uh from what I gathered, August was not known to hold down a job. He was just kind of a uh, he kind of was working as a laborer is what he was always put down in the census records as. He was not exactly well liked. He was known well around town, but not well liked. Um people found him to be kind of odd. Sort of like you, Brian. (laughs) He was known as being odd, kind of, you know, crazy August. People often talked about him being insane. Uh, He was very rough, didn't seem to have very many friends. uh, And a lot of people remarked that he was really hard on his kids. They actually used the word abusive, which, I mean, the standards for abuse back then and today are very different, so for you to actually be called abusive towards your kid back then... You did more than just spank them, or whip them with a belt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, he had to have gone, like, pretty, pretty far with it. Yeah, people did not have a very high opinion of August Swanson. Um, he actually had... There was actually some merit to their, you know, claims of crazy August... Uh, He was committed to independence 15 years before this, after he had attempted to kill himself uh, at the home of his employer, Colonel Van de Vettner. I don't know if I said that right, but he was working for him, and in the middle of his shift, essentially decided it was time to do it, and he tried to slit his throat with a knife in front of a lot of people, and of course, you know, somehow they managed to save his life brought him to Independence. He spent some time there. Independence being the hospital out in Independence, Iowa. It was at that time called the Independence State Hospital for the Insane. Very PC name by today's standards, of course. All right. He had spent some time in Independence, and uh, when he was released, he was presumed to be cured, and he really seemed to make an upward climb. I mean, for him, you know, all things considered in his life, he got, you know, settled into a better job. I think he moved to Clinton after he was released from independence. Uh, He was in Comanche before then, just kind of working on a farm. Uh, He got married to Mary sometime after, uh, and they got married at the Swedish Evangelical Church. Building still stands. It's right by Hy-Vee. And they had their first kid, August Swanson Jr., in 1886. So, What was Mary like? You know, um, 
I think that's probably like was the main point of frustration in the research for this because there is not enough about Mary. I do know that Mary was a Swedish immigrant. She doesn't seem to have been married to anybody but August. And when she died, she had a, you know, a fairly large, I mean, all things considered, obituary for someone in her social standing. If you were not like a real high social status person, you got like one line. This person died. Their funeral was here. The end. But Mary, when she passed away, but she would pass away uh, about a week before Christmas in 1894, um, she was remarked as being a very kind person and having a lot of friends and being the house runner. So while August was very unstable, he didn't seem to be good with money, he couldn't really hold down a job, Mary seemed to be the opposite. She took care of the kids, she kept the house going, she ran the finances, she had friends, she made community connections, and she was active in her church. So there's a nice little yin and yang thing, and I think honestly... You know, she was the reason that August didn't end up going back to independence for a while. But yes, uh, after 1886, they kind of really settled in. They lived at 1221 North 2nd Street. Of course, is no longer there. I think it was actually torn down before like 1926. So it's been gone for a long time. In 1894, Mary developed stomach cancer. So... I'm assuming I feel like she worked. I couldn't really find references to the fact that she could. But once she got ill, there were very... The the money situation just tanked. They had to get assistance from their church, from the Associate Benevolent Society. Another thing that still exists today, which I think is cool that it goes all the way back then. It just got bad. Or maybe it was the medical bills that got them. Because, you know, I don't... I don't know how medical insurance would have worked back then. I don't know that there was medical insurance. I don't think so. I think it was all kind of private pay or... Judging by gun smoke, they would just pay Doc Adams... Couple apples. Or a beer, you know, whatever. Go, oh, Man, if only that still worked, go up to Mercy <laughs> North. <laughs> My appendix is ruptured. Please take this pie. What kind of pie? A- apple. Yuck, you're going to die. Oh, it's cherry. It's cherry. I swear. I swear it's it's cherry. All right. <laughs> smells good. You'll live. Oh, thank God. Today I think they'd probably do it for monster drinks. But anyway, she did get surgery on her stomach cancer, which is something that made me really feel like uh, uncomfortable because, you know, they weren't exactly known for having good anesthesia back then. But uh, they they ended up uh, giving her surgery, and she survived the surgery, which is amazing. Uh, and they thought it looked like she was going to make it out. She was her health was on the up and up, and then one day she just died. We probably left gauze in her by accident. Beef jerky. Oh my god! <laughs> A cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Hey, Jim, where, where's the lid to your beer? <laughs> oh. oh, she's going to find that later. We're going to leave it there. <laughs> but yeah, she she passed away. It was a week before Christmas, which is, gosh, that's that was probably horrible. You got three young boys and a husband that is who's, whose stability is already highly questionable. Mary's death was a very big blow to August. I mean, he had been... You know, while questionable, much improved from his previous state since he had gotten married to to Mary. He, you know, managed to at least, if he didn't hold on to jobs, but he got another job, you know, he stayed kind of on the horse. Um, but once Mary passed away, it was, it was not good. There were no references to him working. Uh, people would say that prostitutes showed up at his house all the time and could regularly be seen leaving with Mary's belongings. The boys were not going to school. They weren't being fed or bathed or really raised at all. They were just kind of there. And, of course, you know, neighbors got together and decided this cannot continue. I mean, these kids could very well die. August is not stable right now. He's definitely not going to be seeking help. And again, I don't even know what kind of help there would be for someone 
you know. Aside from a lobotomy? Oh, that was 40 years later. They didn't even get lobotomies. They're not even lobotomy territory yet. Wow. Mm-mm. You just got the donkey. What about the cutting the hole in the head to let the demons out? <laughs> We're about 100 years after that and 40 years before lobotomy. We're in no man's land, man. It's a bad place, huh? Essentially, I mean, really, there were no... I don't know if... Even if he was like, I am hearing voices, I don't know what to believe, where would he go? Independence. Yeah, well, then he would lose his kids. Right. What about shock therapy? When did that come to be? 50s. So I'm not really sure what... There there were really no at-home things. I mean... There's no local therapist, Bridgeview, Cornerstone. There's no nothing like that. No pathways, no nothing. What about a medical doctor in these days? Possibly. I think usually the medical doctor would be like, oh, they have depression. Cart them off. Or give them some concoction, snake oil. Yeah. Have you ever seen the lists? of reasons people could be admitted to a mental hospital back in the early 1900s. Uh-uh. I, when we post this video, I'm going to put a picture of this list for you, our, our loving audience, to enjoy because, boy, I think just about all of us today would probably be carted off, you know, if we're being honest. Depression, anxiety, excess happiness... Excess happiness. <laughs> yes. Being a member of the Salvation Army, uh, if women were too masculine or guys were too feminine, or if a woman was being too mouthy to her husband, off you go. Away. Away with you. I mean, those are just the obvious ones. There there were a lot. I find that interesting and almost the opposite of what I would have believed to have been true, uh, considering the almost ridiculous amount of symptoms we classify as mental illness today. Apparently it was even worse back then. Anything to back then, and this is just kind of, you know, from my my studies, it seemed like a lot of things that were really just normal human behaviors or normal reactions to life, which was even harder back then than it is today, you know, were considered to be insanity because it challenge societal norms, but they didn't really have a whole lot of names for, you know, mental health stuff. It was, you have schizophrenia, you're crazy, you're hysterical. I mean, heck, there were people that had neurological conditions that would just be considered insanely paralyzed. It's good to recognize when you have struggles, and it's good to encourage people that cannot cope with those using natural methods to get help. But I do agree with you. I think they go too far with it sometimes. You probably had to have much more extreme symptoms in those days uh, to get labeled as one of these than as opposed to today. Yes. Uh, And uh, there really wasn't any of the benefits of modern medicine. That's actually the reason that we call that I want to call this episode what happened before, because today you know, we do have psychotropic medications. And this story could have turned out extremely differently for all involved if, you know, resources has, had existed back then or the attitude was even different. But, you know, they, they could only do what they could do at the time. And, of course, you know, another thing is when you got out of, like, the state hospital, out of the what they called the asylum at the time, there was no aftercare. They were like, you're good. That... That case of, you know, that case of schizophrenia cleared right up. You know, there was no like, hey, go see this doctor or go check in with this doctor. It was just you were in and then you were out and that was it. Interesting. Yes. Kind of reminds me of uh, the the movie Sling Blade where they just, oh, you're cured, you're free to go. And they drop them off in a little town with no resources whatsoever. Yep. Essentially, um... Honestly, I'm not even sure. I think police would have had to have taken him out there. It would have had to have been like an escort kind of deal. And there were two different places you could go. For the more minor cases, you could spend time in the county home or uh, the the county poor farm, which was out in Charlotte. That building's still there as well. But if you were like, 
you know, were a danger to others or in a very, very bad way, you would be brought out or committed to independence. He was brought to independence. He was not brought to the county poor farm at any point from what I can see. So August is kind of, he's kind of wild and out. He's not stable. He has got prostitutes coming to his house. He's not taking care of the kids and the neighbors. They are seeing this and they're saying it is time to intervene. And they tell August and essentially we're going to petition for your kids to go to the Stanton orphanage home. Stanton is all the way on the other side of the state, if I'm not mistaken. And again, you know, Travel was not super easy back then. I haven't seen a like a railroad map, but I imagine it would still be quite a task to get all the way out there. August was very opposed to this. He did not want his kids to leave. I mean, maybe there was a part of him that said, that's my last piece of Mary that, you know, I have with me. But the fact remains that the kids were not being taken care of. So neighbors got together. They petitioned the courts to get the kids removed and that August was noticing these things, and despite his protests, he didn't feel like there was really anything he could do about it. So he came up with a plan to keep the kids from going to Stanton. And perhaps the plan made sense to him. On the day of March 30th of 1895, which at the time of this recording, I mean, is about, what, three weeks? Three weeks away. Um... He kind of goes about his day, and he gets stuff ready for his plan to keep his kids out of Stanton Orphanage home. Kids are, you know, out wandering, just doing what they do. There's not, August did not provide a lot of supervision. Um, But he spent the day going around, running some errands, splitting some wood, sharpening his hatchet, getting some planks together, just, you know, running errands around the house. You know, he was clearly busy with something, and the neighbors saw that, and uh, they they noticed it. When night fell, and Victor, Augie, we'll call him Augie for the sake of clarity, and uh, Albert came home uh, for once. August was, you know, putting them to bed. He was putting effort into getting them calmed down and going to sleep. Uh, which I doubt was probably something that happened very often. Maybe, maybe, that's just speculation. But, so he gets Augie and Victor, who are like 10 or 11 and like 3 or 4 at the time, settled down for the night, and he wants Albert to come upstairs and sleep with him. And Albert is very nervous about this. He's trying to get help from his brothers, And his dad is like, nope, you're sleeping upstairs with me. And even though Albert protested, he ended up going upstairs with his dad. Victor and Augie fall asleep downstairs. August brings uh, Albert upstairs and he gets him to sleep. And Albert gets to sleep in the bed and August is just kind of sitting near the bed. And eventually Albert manages to, to fall asleep and... As After he's gone to sleep, August begins his plan. He very slowly inches Albert over. Now, during the day, he'd taken one of the wooden planks, and he had managed to make a little platform uh, with one end resting on this uh, kind of a chase lounge chair and the other end sandwiched between the mattress and the box spring. And he manages to inch... Albert over and he insists that he never woke up so he must have been very slow and careful he gets him over and he positions Albert so that his head is resting on the chair and his neck is over this plank of wood and then he gets his hatchet that he sharpened and he swings and he decapitates Albert only seven years old now August maintained that Albert never woke up I don't know if that's true. I do know that he probably didn't make a lot of noise because Victor and Augie downstairs, they didn't wake up that night. They didn't hear anything. They didn't notice anything strange except for that their father had barricaded the door to the upstairs. And uh, August, he cleaves the head off. It's, you know, totally separated. 
and he goes and cleans up, washes his hands off, you know, cleans the hatchet, and just kind of on a whim, he goes back and looks at the scene and decides that it's gross. Wow, man, that just made such a mess. Horrible. It was just so, it was so gross and and messy, and he just, uh, he can't go through that twice, twice more, because his intention was to kill all three of his kids. He was going to go downstairs and get the next, but after he looked at Albert's body, he was like, too much work. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe deep inside, you know, there was a level of, I can't believe I did that, but from the way he made it sound in later interviews. It's interesting that he didn't try to come up with a different method. He picked one of the most gruesome methods you could think of. Maybe he had voices in his head specifically telling him to do that. Yeah, his his rationale was they aren't going to take my kids from me. Not that his kids should be dead. My kids have to be dead or, you know, I have to kill them to satisfy something. His rationale was always, they're not going to take my kids. And this was what he saw to be a suitable alternative. So I think maybe in his mind, he was thinking that beheading him would be the quickest or the most pain-free. I mean... I, I don't know. I'm... He was clearly very sick, so you really can't try to think logically about this, about what no. his intentions. I mean, he probably had a gun, but he didn't want anyone to wake up because the other two kids would have ran or fought him on it. So after August has decided that he is not going to... He, he just can't. He can't do any of this. He He's not going to keep doing that. He decides that... You know, different methods have to be used for Victor and August, but he, he's he got to go. He can't stay in the house. So he ends up going and piling things outside of the house. So essentially, he's locked the kids inside the house. Um, they can't get out. I don't know if he nailed boards to the door or what. I'm going to guess he probably just piled stuff out um, because the kids did not wake up. Uh, throughout the night, and then he took his leave. He headed down to the river, and nobody saw him for quite a while after that. And people started to get kind of suspicious. Now, Vic, Victor and Augie, they woke up the next morning. They were going to go get Albert from upstairs, and, of course, the door was, like, nailed shut. They could not open it. And they didn't hear anything, and they didn't see their dad, so they figured that maybe their dad had taken Albert somewhere and... You know, that was it. Well, then they tried to get out. The door was shut. They could not get out. There was no food in the house whatsoever. Uh, so they escaped through a window because I guess that August forgot about the windows and just kind of went about and tried to take care of themselves for a few days. They ended up going to a friend of their mother's who, and they would, she took care of them uh, while they were trying to find August. After about two days, people were really suspicious. They still haven't seen Albert. They still haven't seen August. The house has boards on the outside of it. The two boys have been living with someone else, and they've decided it's time to call the police. So they call the Merchant's Police, Merchant's Police Pollens. And for a while, I didn't know what that was, but I guess the Merchant's Police was essentially like a private law enforcement member, kind of like a, you know, like a private investigator is considered some kind of law enforcement, but they're not a cop or a sheriff, you know. But they got Merchant Police Pollens, who was already irritated because, you know, he'd been spending a couple days trying to find his boat that someone had stolen uh, from the shore of the river. And they get him and they're like, you know, we haven't seen August Swanson. You and I both know he's not stable. He hasn't been acting right for months now. And we can't find Albert Swanson either. Uh, his two sons are over at, I think her name was Lorna. I can't remember her name. Her, his two sons, his two other sons, they're over at a fan, family friend's house. And they don't know what happened. So 
can you please do a wellness check? So he goes in. Someone called an investigator from the Clinton Herald. Stuff that wouldn't happen today. Um, (laughs) The reporter from the Clinton Herald got to go in with the police officer and take the barricades off the door, and they unlock the upstairs. They take the barricades off of that, and they go upstairs, and, of course, they found Albert upstairs. They found his dead body. And his head. And his head. They did. I think maybe one of the reasons that it hadn't been noticed or investigated sooner is a lot of the times when there are bodies to be found in a populated area, there's a complaint about the smell. Um, But the days between March 30th of 1895 and April 1st, those two days, um, were very cold. They were in the 20s and, and low 30s. So, I mean, he would have been fairly well preserved Uh, And I doubt very much that the house had heat. The window was left open. That's how they determined August had slipped out through that window. He'd gone down onto the kitchen roof and hopped off of the hopped off of the roof from there uh, before he barricaded the house and and made his departure. And of course, there wasn't a long suspects list. They everyone knew that August had done this, and they started looking for him and. He was nowhere to be found. Um, They did find Merchant Police Pollen's boat on the other side of the river and determined that August was the person who had stolen his boat and brought it across. And past that, there was a lot of speculation as to what had happened. Did August head over to Illinois? Did he kill himself? That was the most popular theory is that he he had died by suicide. He drowned himself. And then people were saying he was, he was in the bottom of the river. They had to have known. I mean, dead bodies don't sink like that. You'd have to be pretty committed. I guess you'd have to think that out. You'd have to, like, put something around your ankle or something. So they found his boat across the river. They did. They found the boat across the river, the two sons. They did not know anything happened to Albert for a while. It was at least, like, a week Uh, or at least, you know, like the better part of a week. Uh, They just thought August was on the lam, and they were living with a family friend, and eventually they'd come back. Albert would come back. I mean, honestly, I think the biggest... Albert was the biggest victim, but what happened to the other two boys during this time has got to be equally horrible. I mean, their mom died a week before Christmas. They've been living with their father, who's abusive, and, you know, he's got some really bad mental health issues. He hasn't been taking care of them, you know, not going to school or having really any semblance of stability. And then one day they're locked inside the house and they can't find their dad or their brother. So they just go out and try to fend for themselves. You know, they end up staying with a friend of the family, but they still don't know what's going on. Their world must have just been turned upside down. So in the week following August's disappearance, the boys went over to stay with their mother's friend, Mrs. Neeson. I don't know which Mrs. Neeson that is, but whoever Mrs. Neeson was, she was a kind person because she let those boys stay with them for like a week. Was it Liam? No, not Liam. And they were not taken. They went there voluntarily. Anywho, the community really came around these two boys, even with, you know, their family legacy and not being from, you know, a really respected family and all the hell that they'd been through, uh, their neighbors came together, their church came together, the Swedish Evangelical Lutheran Church took a collection up for them uh, and from the members of the congregation and from their neighbors, and they actually ended up with about $623 in today's money. Back then it was eighteen fifty, But they used that money to give Albert a proper funeral, and he was buried in Springdale Cemetery right next to his mom. And that funeral only ended up costing thirteen fifty. so there were $5 left over. That would be about $123 today. And all of the proceeds didn't go to the church. The extra went with the boys, when they went to the Stanton Orphanage, which did end up happening. 
August Swanson was still missing during all of that time. They did manage to get the two boys, you know, over in Stanton on the other side of the state. And we'll talk a little bit about what that was probably like. Um, but in the meantime, everyone is on edge because this guy that just cut his own kid's head off is on the loose. He's on the lam. No one has seen him. They don't know where he is. Was there fear? Yes. There People was... were afraid that he was going to... He was this crazy murderer that might break into their house and do the same to them. Oh, 100%. I mean, there were two running theories. One was that he killed himself, and the other one was that he had run off to, you know, some place in Illinois. And, yes, people were afraid. They put out their whatever the 1895's version of an all-points bulletin was. They put it out to all of the surrounding community police departments, and they actually did get a hit in Clarence, Iowa, and they arrested this guy and interrogated him before they figured out it wasn't August Swanson. I kind of wonder, I mean, today there's a big culture difference between the 1890s and today, but I remember when I was a teenager, there was uh, the Clinton rapist that was going around for a while, you know, before they were caught and they were sent to prison. Uh, but people that I went to school with were like, I saw him. We didn't even know who he was. We'd be like, I saw him. He looked at me from the bottom of the stairs. <laughs> I'd be like, how did, how did you know it was him? I just knew. <laughs> so it makes me kind of wonder, you know, if they had people doing that. Like, I saw August Swanson buying a pineapple from the deli. They didn't. They, I mean, uh, yeah, anyway. But I wonder if that was something that happened was, you know, all of these fake sightings. It's hard to know because uh, with the online community paper archive, uh, it doesn't always bring up all the actual results if the code read it wrong or whatever. So one of these days I'll have to go back by hand through all the microfilm and see if there were any of such stories, because I'd be interested to know if people were busybodies like that back then, too. Um, but yes, they arrested someone in Clarence. It wasn't him. They'd never found him. He came back on his own. Um, on April 8th, which was a week after they found Albert's body, a neighbor was sitting in his kitchen with his wife, and who should just walk right into their house without knocking but August Swanson. And of course, they were probably, you know, just frozen with fear. And I guess they had a fairly calm conversation. Uh, Where have you been? And August Swanson said, on the bluffs. He said, okay. And he asked where his two boys were and if Albert had gotten a funeral. And his neighbor's like, yeah, yeah, man. Uh, Okay. And then August Swanson just left. He just walked away. And didn't, you know, I'm sure that the neighbor probably waited a little while because, again, people knew what he did and they knew, you know, his reputation. But after a while, that neighbor got out of the house and he ran all the way down to City Hall, which at that time really wasn't super far from where it is. Because, again, this is happening around Jewel, where Jewel is. And City Hall at that time was right, I think, right next to where the Van Allen building is. So he goes and he runs. I am assuming he probably waited because he wanted to make sure that August was actually gone and he wasn't going to come back and, like, attack his wife or anything. But when he got down there, there was this big crowd of people out in front of City Hall. Like, hundreds of people were all out there yelling and all kinds of stuff, and he manages to puncture through the crowd enough to find a little space around a guy leaning coolly up against the side of the building, and it was August Swanson, just leaning against City Hall, taking a rest, with all these people out there screaming, and uh, I guess that there were a lot of people that were wanting to lynch him right there on the spot. We're going to hang him! And the police actually came out and let him yell for a while. They're like, all right, who's going to do it? They're like, we're going to have a necktie party. And they actually were kind of given the opportunity to do it. No one stepped forward and actually attacked him. And I don't know if that's because they were, 
you know, really that afraid of him. Or maybe they were like, oh, the police will stop us or something. But Or was it maybe that it wasn't satisfying enough because of how calm he was? Oh, yeah. In every um, instance that he is described after this, he is just totally flat, just cool, emotionless. He was like that throughout the trial, throughout his interrogations, etc. Well, after the police finally decided to bring him into the station, um, he, they got a full confession from him. He talked about what he had done and what his plans were. So he admitted that, yes, he did kill his son, Albert. And he said that Albert never woke up. It took three swings with the hatchet, which is... <sighs> I think one of the parts of the story that kind of, you know, makes my stomach churn because they only saw two nicks in the board. So if you think about the physics of what that probably implies, it's not, you know, it's pretty upsetting. And I've just uh, transferred that image to you guys. Sorry. To think that, well, it's stated that the kid didn't wake up. It's not. There's no way. Uh, He couldn't make any sound, though. Which is, I mean, I think the one comfort that you can probably say is he did die quickly. Yes. I mean, even if he didn't die immediately, he probably died very quickly. Um, But August confessed to all of that. He's talked about wanting to kill his other two kids to keep them from going and being taken away from him. And he talked about, well, when I went back and looked at the scene, it was just so gross. I just couldn't. I couldn't do it again. It was just, it was a disgusting scene. It made his stomach churn. And he fled. And he snuck onto a train. And he went out to DeKalb. And his plan, once he got to DeKalb, was to work until he made enough money to buy a ticket back to Sweden. But, you know, it was hard for him to get a job out there. He ended up sleeping in, like, different utility buildings near the railroad station And I guess he described them in a lot of detail, so people were, you know, fain to believe him. And he decided that he had some stuff he wanted to come back and grab before he went back to Sweden. And that's why he came back to Clinton. And when he got to his house, of course, it was gone. I mean, they posted his houses for rent, like, really quickly afterwards. And he spent some time on the bluffs. So I'm going to guess what he means when he says on the bluffs is Springdale Cemetery, which is on a bluff. I think he went and visited his son and his wife's graves. Later on when he was asked, like years later, and they said, what did you do during that week? He said that he spent a lot more time laying on his wife's grave and crying um, than he had previously let on. But yeah, he gave a full confession. Uh, The Clinton Herald reporter was in the room with him when he did this. And he said he didn't really show a lot of emotion at all. He just was flat, you know, like he was describing a sports game he watched or, you know, something like that. Heck, he probably didn't even have as much emotion as talking about a sports game. But he ended up pleading not guilty. When I first read that, I was like, oh, my gosh, how are you going to give a confession And plead not guilty. (laughs) But it was by reason of insanity. And, of course, you know, the town was out to... They did not want this guy to live. They wanted him to be hung. Which, you know, he did kill a seven-year-old. His son, no less. You know, in a very cold and calculated manner. He was granted an extension on the trial so that his defense attorney could get some details on, like, other instances of him acting, as they put it, insane. And when the trial happened the following year, he was declared to be not guilty by reason of insanity and quickly shipped out to independence. And he died there. He was there until he died in 1926. How old was he when he died? He would have been 50... No, 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 no. He would have been 63. Yeah, he would have been 63. But he ended up passing away pretty much from old age, from heart issues. I don't know. He never got out of there, though. He was there for the rest of his life. But maybe, you know, when he got to independence, maybe his life was better. Having someone that can help give him stability or whatever, you know. I mean, 
we a lot of the times when you hear or read on like the old asylums, the old state institutions, the image you get are like, you know, feces everywhere and rat infested and overcrowded and six people to a bed. But really, independence as far as like Iowa goes, it, it was pretty nice. You know, it was humane, as humane as they could be at that time. We talked earlier about different treatment methods. Uh, what were some of the treatment methods they did have at independence? Um, so independence was what they called the Kirkbride plan. So Kirkbride plans referred to the layout of the building that was built. Uh, there was a big central hub for community and offices and medical services in the middle, and then the the wings that came off of that hub. And we'll insert a picture in the video, too. Uh, they were the patient areas, you know, their living areas and stuff. Um, a lot of what they did then was holistic stuff. They didn't really, like I said, have much medical intervention. Thorazine, which was the first antipsychotic, which is probably what they would have prescribed him with, didn't come around until like the 50s. It was still quite some time before that would be, uh, you know, a thing. Uh, they might have tried, you know, some kind of psychotherapy uh, as the years progressed. Um, they did a lot of work therapy, going out and, you know, farming or tending to animals um, but really, with Kirkbride plans, when the idea was to make the patient feel respected, you know, like the like I, I went and toured Independence, which is so cool. Ten out of ten recommend, Brian. I think you'd think that place is awesome. Absolutely, I would love to go out there. They have an organ toilet. You get to see the room where they did the lobotomies, and there's a toilet that they flushed organs down. It's like a big square toilet. Wow. <laughs> anyway but with kirk brides the whole idea was to make the patient feel respected like when you go through the building all the ceilings are very high because that was a sign you know having high ceilings was a sign of being wealthy mm -hmm. you know so a lot of the stuff they did was holistic you know good meals and stuff like that i wonder if they had any kind of a treatment plan in place for him uh, any kind of a goal as far as rehabilitation or did they just send send him there for life i think with his history they knew it wouldn't have been good to release him at this point after already having treatment and supposedly being cured yes and then having relapses in the middle right on top of that uh well i mean i know he never got out People knew what he did. This was reported all around the state, this story was. And there really wouldn't have been, you know, any way for him to get out and start a new life. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, but I know he stayed there for the rest of his life. Every single census that happened after he was put in at 1895, he was listed as, they called them inmates. Which, of course, kind of contradicts everything I just said about making them feel you know whatever but that's just what the census you know census takers called them was inmates but yeah there you go a little history lesson for you um the two boys that survived uh august swanson jr augie and his little brother victor albin they ended up going to the stanton orphanage august swanson jr stopped going by that name there's a little part of me that thinks he might have gotten to choose his own name because he started going by swan swanson but neither of them were adopted from the orphanage. They both aged out. Um, but from what I can find about the Stanton Swedish Lutheran orphanage is that they were very compassionate. It was, a, it was considered a good place for them to go. They had, I think, I've seen different numbers on how many kids were there at a time. I think around then they'd served 80 kids. Um, there is a picture, and I think that the brothers are in that picture, but they don't have names, so I can't tell you which one they are, and I'll put that up on the screen as well. It was, it was nice. It was just like a house. When people would age out when they turned 18 and they moved out, they would visit each other, like, you know, brothers visiting each other. Victor stayed in the area. He moved to the neighboring town of Red Oak, and he got married to Lolly, and they had two kids, and he ended up you know, running a big dairy farm operation 
and he passed away in 1955. And from all appearances, they seemed to have a pretty good life together. I mean, considering that it, he had a rough start. Again, he was four, though, when this stuff happened. He was only four or five years old. So he old. probably doesn't really remember it. I'm sure that the memories are probably very hazy. Right. Kids have this great... <sighs> stuff sticks with them, but in other ways, they have a really good ability to overcome when given a chance. Um, and he did okay for himself. He had two kids. His two kids lived with him for a long time in Red Oak. His wife and him went on vacation. They visited places. They participated in church and did reunions and all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, the oldest one seemed to have a little bit of a harder time, and that was August Jr., now known as Swan Swanson. But he, like, left left town. Now, mind you, he would have been, like, 12 when this happened, you know, in that neighborhood. So he would have been quite traumatized. Oh, absolutely. And he would have, like, you know, in that week between his brother and his dad disappearing and them being brought to the orphanage, he probably would have figured out what was going on or right. what could have happened. Where Victor, he might have had some level of obliviousness, but... Not for not for Augie. He would have known. He would have figured it out. And he would have seen a lot of stuff, you know, been older when his dad was being abusive or whatever. So when he aged out of the program, he left left. He ended up in, in some small town in Idaho and started his own little dairy farm on his own. And he got married to a dolly. Dolly and Lolly. Yes. It's cute matching names. I know they didn't plan it. And both dairy farmers. Yes. But he never had any kids. I don't know if that was intentional or if it was, you know, a medical thing, but he never had any kids, and he ended up dying of a heart condition in his 30s. Wow. Uh, he was buried out in, in Idaho. He never came back to Iowa unless he visited and it wasn't recorded. Anyway, thus ends the stories of the Swansons. Um, as horrible as that beginning of the story was, and it is really a horrible thing. I mean, I bet there's, I bet they were good kids too. I mean, there's no evidence to suggest that they were particularly good or bad kids. They really don't talk a whole lot about their character. Uh, but I do know that even today. If you have a certain family name, you are kind of uh, biased right. towards that. For example, I am a Robbins, and people know the Robbins around town, and they don't have a very good reputation. I've had people just automatically assume that, you know, I'm, you know, just like all the other Robbins, which I think is, you know, maybe not fair because some of us are really cool. Um, but I feel like for them to be taken care of and have so much love and support shown to them, they must have had some good qualities to them. Right. Yeah. I, I would love to have any other internet sleuths that might have taken an interest in this case. Show me what you can find, what, what you think would be noteworthy. If we missed anything, please fill us in. That'd be good. I'd love to see it. I guess I think when I when I look back at all of this, what what really sticks out to me is the way the systems used to work. As far as the the independence institution and uh, and the orphanage, they they seem to run more like how would you you would expect them to run in modern days, as opposed to what we we've come to believe things were like back then. That's not to say that you know obviously those came from somewhere, but. Yeah, well, there, there's definitely truth to those stereotypes, but I think in some ways, and maybe this is just my own sense of exceptionalism, Iowa's always been ahead and forward thinking in those ways. Right. The independence, I mean, it's been overcrowded before, and any place there's anybody in a position of power over someone else, there's bound to be, you know, some instances of abuse. But compared to, like, the stuff you would see in Illinois, just across the river, much better. And this was at a time period where they really didn't have, you know, they did go on to do lobotomies, so there is that. 
Yes, they started looking at mental health more medically, and that was a good thing and a bad thing for a while. You know, they still do lobotomies. It's still a thing. I did not know that. It's very, very rare. But yes, they do still do them. I know they still do shock therapy. Yeah, ECT actually has kind of turned out to be a good thing. It's super different than it would have been when they first came out with it. It's, it's not like, okay, yeah, it's not like what you would imagine. No, they put they put you out, and it's very low voltage. It does affect your memory, but it's like, you know, if you're depressed and meds don't help and exercise and holistic therapies don't help, counseling isn't helping, ECT is like the last line of defense. And it seems to like really have you know done some great things of course you know back back when it first started it was probably just as horrible as you know it was to be seen in that you know what was it one flew out the cuckoo's nest like a step or two below an electric chair yes but there are i i do think some of the things that are interesting so i took a social work class um uh, the second year i was in college and one thing that the teacher kept saying was, back in the day, people used to take care of each other. Someone broke their leg and they couldn't work. The neighbors brought them food. Um, you know, if someone's parents died, the neighbors would bring them to whatever facility or that kind of stuff. Like you'd go to your neighbors to get some flour if you wanted to make some bread and you didn't have any flour. Yeah, you helped each other out. And you see that in this story. You see that... People really did do what they could for for these kids, and they did what they could for the family as well, because they were supporting them all the way since at least fall of 1894, all the way until March, you know. Yes, Clinton was affluent, but at that time, things were declining, you know. The, the lumber industry was starting to slow down, so not everyone was wealthy, you know, but they took care of each other. I don't know, there was just a lot of, as horrible as the story is, uh, there was a lot of kindness that I really kind of, it was refreshing to see. Um, I, we hope that you enjoyed the podcast, and uh, like I said earlier, if you can find any more details on this case or on the Swanson family or what happened to the kids, I would gladly accept them. You know, I, I'm interested in these people that have been past for a long time. They're a part of our history. So please comment below. Uh, subscribe if you would like to hear more content. And uh, we do have some more episodes coming up soon. So uh, stay tuned. Peace. Hello there. I am a sophisticated zombie.